Amen. Amen. Let's see your Bibles this morning. Word. Let's see your pens. Pens in your bulletin. Bulletin. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 11. Exodus 11. Exodus is the second book in the Bible, the exit from Egypt. And we will finish this book before the end of the year. Matter of fact, the Sunday before the Christmas, I'm shooting for it to have our big quiz on the book of Exodus. Remember that big quiz we had? Okay, so people, please be doing the quizzes on the internet, and we're going to slam it home on the, sun, the, the second last Sunday of the year. We're going to go through all the book of Exodus. And so just be doing your quizzes, and I'll give it to you the week before you can study. If you weren't here a month ago and we did this, uh, you'll enjoy it. We had a lot of fun. I don't want to get into it on time, but uh, that, that's what I'm shooting for. We're going to finish this book by the end of the year. At this rate, we'll take 33 years to get through the Bible. <laughs> I was watching Popeye yesterday. Popeye the Sailor Man, one of my favorite guys. And he was feeding his four children uh, lunch. And he gave them all spinach. They didn't want to eat spinach. So Popeye needed to tell them why he eats spinach and take them back to the first time he ate spinach and why he eats spinach for his strength. So he started telling the story about when he was fighting Hercules, this big muscle-bound dude. And they were fighting, and they were having this contest, and they both climbed to the top of a little hill. And, and they were having a tug of war on top of the hill. And, and Hercules tied the rope around a rock and just stood there. And, and Popeye's trying to pull this mountain to him and realized he was losing. And so Popeye reached in his shirt and grabbed some garlic and started to smell the garlic. Muscles popped out and he pulled the whole mountain over to him, punched over Hercules, spun him on top of his head, tied the rope around him and spun him like a top. And he was da 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 da. And then his. The power from the garlic wore off. Hercules um, got out of the rope, punched Popeye across the field, then comes starts beating him down, and Popeye's all knocked out, and he reaches down into his shirt to get the garlic, and Hercules goes, oh my gosh, the garlic, and he takes out uh, chlorophyll and pours it on the garlic, kills the garlic, Popeye smells it, gets no strength, and he has no power. So Hercules says, all I have to do is blow on you and I can beat you. This is a true story, by the way. This really happened. And uh, I really didn't see this. He blow, blows Popeye, and Popeye goes across this field and grows into a garden of spinach. And he eats the spinach, and he gets his muscles, and that's the beginning of him eating spinach. Okay, it's not like a cartoonist didn't make this up. This is really how it happened. So he's telling his kids this. Does anybody, know, does anybody know this? Okay, does anybody not know this? You, if you didn't know it, say amen. I, I didn't know this. I didn't know that, that, that this is how Popeye got into spinach. So, <laughs> as I was watching this, I was like, there is historical precedence to Popeye eating spinach. It's not something some cartoonist made up. He really had a reason for that. When we talk about Jesus dying on the cross, his blood being shed for our sin, there's historical precedence even before he did it. In other words, Jesus is labeled as the Lamb of God, the Lamb that was slain, the blood of the Lamb to cover our sin. That was all taught to us thousands of years before Christ was born in the flesh of Mary. And we're going to look at that story today. Now, what also comes with that story, though, is the necessity for us to be involved in that process. There is something you have to do in order to take advantage of the lamb that was slain, in order to take advantage of the salvation that God offers us through that death of the lamb. There's something you have to do. If you do this something, you will live. If you don't do this something, you will not live. And when we read the story we're going to read today about the Passover and, the, and, and Pharaoh and the plagues, this is one of the most vivid pictures, one of the most vivid pictures of this happening. This is not an accident, this story is in the Bible. Remember, the whole Bible is 66 books that was written by 40 authors, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and God is telling us a story from Genesis to Revelation of his plan of redemption of mankind. All mankind. Okay? Now let's, let's go to the map. Let's get a little review. Moses had a conversation with fire. 
God was a talking fire. And God told Moses, go back to Pharaoh and demand that he let my people go. There were over two, three million Jews that were enslaved in Egypt. So Moses goes up and talks to Pharaoh in Egypt and says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, no, I'm the man. So God says, I'm going to send plagues on Egypt. And what the plagues were designed to do was to judge the gods of the Egyptians. So some of the plagues we're going to see. One plague was he turned the Nile into blood. The Nile River was worshipped as a god, and some of the fish were worshipped as a god. All the fish died. Another plague was that God, the next one, God sent hail down on all the Egyptians and, and, and tore up all the crops. The next one was that God sent frogs all over the land. <laughs> they worshipped the toad. And this is not necessarily the order that happened, but there's frogs everywhere. Then he sent locusts all over the land. And the last one, the ninth one, actually there were ten, but the ninth one uh, that we looked at last week was God sent darkness over the land. That's the slide. It was just dark. It was so dark you could feel it. <laughs> And so what we're going to look at today is that God's going to send the last plague. The firstborn of every family is going to die. And then the people are going to leave. There's one more slide, I believe. The people are going to leave, be led by a pillar of fire. And so next week we're going to see them cross the Red Sea. So let's, let's look at our Bibles. Chapter 11, verse 1. Chapter 11. The Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. And when he lets you go, he will surely drive you out here altogether. Speak now in the hearing of the people and let every man ask from his neighbor and every woman from her neighbor articles of silver and gold. Now, let me stop right there. Let's think with me. With them. They've been there for 430 years, slaves. Pharaoh has, for about nine months period, said, I'm not letting the people go. God has sent plague after plague after plague. Nine plagues. They're getting ready to get number 10. And so what God's telling Moses, Moses, I want you to, when, when I send this last plague, they're going to drive you out. And when you leave, before you leave, I want you to go to all your neighbors, and I want you to ask them for their silver and gold and their clothing. Why? Well, we're going to see in a few weeks that God is going to use all the silver and gold and the clothing and, and, and valuables that they're going to take from the Egyptians when they leave. In other words, they've been slaves, and all of a sudden now they're getting ready to get leave. They say, oh, by the way, let me have some of your gold. Let me have, okay, just take everything. We just want you to go. They're going to carry around all this gold and silver in the wilderness, and they can't spend it anywhere. <laughs> what do they got it for? Hint, they're going to use it to build a tabernacle of God. Amen. They didn't know that, but of course God did. Let's keep reading. God is so amazing. He's a strategic planner verse 3 the Lord gave God favor the Lord the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians moreover the man of Moses was very great in the land of Egypt and in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people Moses was a great man verse 4 Moses said thus says the Lord at midnight I will go into all the midst of Egypt and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill and the firstborn of all the animals two questions why would God kill the firstborn I don't know. I mean, I know why he killed the firstborn. Why would God kill all these people? You know, some people don't follow the Bible because of things God does. I'm not following a God who kills people. Well, guess what? All of us are going to die one day. You're going to die. So you might as well step back and ask yourself, where else are you going to go to get life? God set the rules. Do you have a freedom to set your own rules? Yes, but that doesn't mean your rules will work. I was on a plane witnessing to a guy the other day, and he says, well, you know, more people died in religious wars than any other thing. And I said, and what is your point? <laughs> Does that mean God is wrong? No, it means people just fought over stuff they believed. It doesn't even mean that the religions that they were fighting for was necessarily biblical. They were just fighting because of something they believed. That means that people have passion about what they believe. That's all that means. It has nothing to do with whether Christ is really the Lord, whether he offers you salvation, whether salvation is real. It has nothing to do with that. Don't confuse the two. And when you read this and go, I don't understand why God would do this. I can't. I don't either. That does not change the fact that he did it. And it doesn't change the fact that there's a world and a heaven and he's organized and he's got a plan. And then we need to wait till the end of the plan. So what happens is he tells you the firstborn. Now, the other reason that he did, the question you might say is why the, fir why the firstborn? The firstborn of every family had special privilege over all the other kids. The firstborn represented the family. The firstborn son was the hope of the, that the family would continue. 
So the firstborn child was put on a pedestal. They had special dignity, special honor, special uh, even privilege in the inheritance because they had a special responsibility to care for the family. God says, I'm going to take that from you because I'm going to show you that don't even worship your kids. I'm God. You worship me. You trust in me. So God, and many other reasons, I'm sure he did this. Let's keep reading. Verse 6. There was a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as was not like it before, nor shall it be like it again. But against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move its tongue, and against man and beast that you may know that the Lord does not make a difference between the Egyptians and the Israelites. I have a little dog, a little Dotson that weighs about six pounds, and this dog is the most friendly, playful. All this dog wants to do is play. But whenever we put our dog in its kennel, and he, as soon as we just jiggle our keys, she goes and grabs a little purple ball, picks it up, and goes in her kennel automatically. We don't have to tell her. She knows. We're leaving. You've got to go in the kennel. She goes in there, and she's the sweetest little dog. She just wants to play with everybody. And even people come to my house or come to the door and knock on the door. She, she, all she's doing is she wants to play. But I'll, before I open the door, I'm like, get him, Rover. Get him, Rover. Sick him. <laughs> and you open the door, and it's a little tiny four-pound just want to lick on your hand, you know. <laughs> Rover, her name is Lucy. <laughs> so I try to scare people, you know, but when you hear, ow, 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 I don't think people are scared. But when we put her in her kennel, as soon as we close the kennel, she has this seizure and she goes, ow, 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 ow. she turns like a dog with rabies. <laughs> we don't know why. But you know what the Bible says? That there's going to be death in all these families, but in all the Jewish families, not even their dog will growl at them. Not even their dog. Look what it says. You might have missed it. I read by it real quick. Look at, verse, look at verse 7. But against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move its tongue. Not even a dog is going to bark. I mean, you be walking down the street, the dog won't even bark at you. Ah, you know, a dog won't. Oh, Jew, Jew, Israelite. Oh. Point number one, you must secure a lamb to be slain. Death is coming, and God is giving you an option. Secure a lamb to be slain. Chapter 12, look what it says. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. The Jews began their calendar over the month it'd be right here. Month number one, we're starting everything over. Everything in the past is gone, we're recalibrating your calendar on this event. Okay, their month, their, their month is not our, their 12 months is not our 12 months. Verse 3, speak to all the children of Israel saying, on the 10th of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb according to his house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then let him and his neighbor next to his house take according to the number of persons, according to each man's need. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male first year. You shall make it from the, one of the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. The whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. What they had to do, they said, listen, we're going to start the calendar over. On this day, I want you to, on the 10th day of the month, I want you to get a lamb, one years old, no blemish, no ticks, no fleas, no ex ex eczema, what is it, eczema, eczema, no, uh, no limp, none of this. And actually, in, in verse 46, it can't even have a broken bone. I want you to take this lamb in your house for four days. On day 10 of the month, you take it in your house. On day 14, you kill it. So for four days, I want you to love this lamb. I want you to get to know this lamb. I want you to care for this lamb, and this lamb is going to give you love. I was watching um, a Discovery Channel, Animal Planet, the other day, and this guy cared for this gorilla for four or five years. And he, he grew very close to this gorilla. And then they had to take the gorilla away from him to another habitat, and for 11 years, he didn't see this gorilla. So after 11 years, he went back went over to this place to see the gorilla, and he was so nervous. I, was, I cried when I saw this. He, he was so nervous because he wasn't sure whether this gorilla would remember him. He had a special name for her, Sue, called her Sue. And 
he walked up to this cage and said, hey, Sue, hey, he's calling her. She's, she's not right there. She's like down in this little cave. And he's calling her, hey, Sue, come here, girl, come here. Just like he used to 11 years before. Wondering, is she going to remember me? Because he was so fond and close to this gorilla. Well, this gorilla came out of this hole, this little cave holding her baby, kind of like this, and then ran faster and faster and faster to this man. Then immediately fell on the ground, reached through the fence, and hugged him. I was crying. <laughs> Let's cry. <laughs> I was crying because it was kind of emotional. Plus, I, 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 I would love, wouldn't you love to have that relationship with something that big? I mean, this thing was like a thousand pound muscle. And she's carrying a baby. She's like running, running, running faster, faster, faster. And she and just hugs him immediately. She didn't like, well, who are you? No, I remember you. And then he reached through and he's holding her hand and her baby's hand. And her baby is holding his hand. Imagine God saying to you, I want you to take this lamb. It's only four days, though. But you care for this lamb, bring it in your house, not in a cage outside. And then I want you to kill it. You know, Jesus is the Lamb of God. Write this down if you're taking notes. John chapter 1, verse 29. Just John 1, 29. John the Baptist was baptizing. And John, when he saw Jesus coming to be baptized, what did he say? Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Wow, what a coincidence. How is it that in Exodus, thousands of years before, God says, I want you to take a lamb, and in a minute, you're going to put the blood on the door, and the angel of death is going to pass over you if the blood of the lamb is on your door. And what a coincidence that Jesus is the lamb of God whose blood is going to be on the cross, is going to, and if you apply the blood to your life, the angel of death will pass over you. How is that? It's just like Popeye. <laughs> There's a real story behind this. Did Jesus... When he was born, did he copy that? No, no, no. He was the one who authored it. <laughs> he was the one who authored it. He was the one who's been preparing for us for thousands of years for what he would do. So no one could say it was a coincidence or it didn't mean anything. No, it had historical meaning. It had historical foundation. John chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says that Christ is our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Christ is the Passover lamb. 1 Peter 1, chapter 17, verse to 20. 1 Peter 1, 17 to 20. It says, since you call on a father, capital F, father, who judges each man work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver and gold, that you were redeemed from this empty life, but with the precious blood of Christ, what a lamb without blemish or defect. Israelites, Moses said, get a lamb without blemish or defect. Get a lamb without blemish or defect. And by the way, in verse 46 of chapter 12, get a lamb that, whose bones will not be broken. Do you know when Jesus was crucified, the Bible says in the Old New Testament that his bones were not broken? Do you know the Bible says that his blood was shed for our sin? Do you know that God is preparing us here to get the blood of a lamb, the first thing you got to do is you got to secure a lamb. What is your lamb? Where are you going to get forgiveness? I was talking to this guy on the plane. He was saying, well, you know, I'm a good guy. And I, I, I don't do this, and I, I believe I'm this, I'm, I'm better than this and that, and God's, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go to hell, and blah, blah, blah. I said, hmm. Hmm. And I believe everyone has their own way. I said, hmm. I said, what's your president's name? He told me the president of his company. I said, if I got a job at your company and told your president, your president, by the way, that I'm going to do things my way. I'm not going to do things the way he prescribed. I'm not going to follow their handbook, and I'm not going to listen to the, the, the directions from the human resources department, your minimum operating standards. I don't know. I'm going to do my own. What would happen to me? He says, well, you, I, I said, I would probably lose my job. I said, now, you believe in a God, right? He said, yeah. I said, well, do you, you believe that God, at this higher power, coordinates everything in the earth, plants, flowers, bees, birds, fish, Bear feeds them all, and all the planets, and all the moons, and stars, and supernovas, and galaxies, and universes, and all this. He got, well, he got, he's got a lot of stuff going on, don't he? Yeah. And now, don't you think that God is kind of somewhat at least as organized as your president? And at least requires a certain minimum operating standard for how we should live and treat each other, uh, just like your president? And it has a manual, just like your president? 
Don't you, don't you think that? And don't you think that, that just like your president, you and I can't make up our own rules? That he said it in stone over a thousand years. He, he taught us it over and over and over again. Don't, don't you think so? And, and don't you think that, that and who would you to be to think that you can tell God that God is wrong, that Jesus died on the cross for nothing, and you have another plan better than his? I was watching CNN last night. They had a show on faith and Christianity and evangelicals, and, 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 and one guy said, do you believe Jesus is the only way to heaven? And he said, Jesus said that. Well, don't you think that you're judging other people and being exclusive and you're not being in inclusive? No, no, no. It is inclusive. Everybody is welcome. <laughs> Everybody's welcome. And one guy who a pastor, well, I, one, one, they, they asked the other pastor, would you ever say that Jesus is the only way? He says, I would never use exclusive language. This is a guy who's wanting to placate to the world. I would never use exclusive language. I have to, you have to include everybody. I says, Jesus said, I'm the way to truth and life. No one gets to the Father but through me. What does that mean? That I'm the way to truth and life. No one gets to the Father but through me. <laughs> Jesus says, I did not come to be served, but to serve and give my life for a ransom for many. Nobody else said that. So it's not that we're trying to exclude everybody. We're just trying to make sure you know the way. You need to know the way. And that's it. And guess what? Anybody, anybody who wants to submit their life to Christ, well, he will forgive. But when you say, I have another way, I challenge you to ask, what is that way? Who and what is going to give you life if they don't have life themselves? So you have to secure a lamb. Number two, you have to apply the blood of the lamb. You must apply the blood of the lamb. Chapter 12, verse 21. Verse 21, it says, Moses called the elders of Israel and said, Pick out a lamb for yourselves according to your families and kill it on the Passover, kill the Passover lamb. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, which is a plant, and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike Egypt, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and the doorpost, the Lord will pass over. Everyone say Passover. The Lord will pass over the door and allow the destroyer to not come into your house and strike you. And you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons. It shall come to pass when you come into the land of the Lord, just as he promised that you shall keep the service. And it shall be when your children say to you, Popeye, why are we eating spinach? Then you shall say, it is the Passover sacrifice, the Passover sacrifice for the Lord who passed over the house of the children of Israel when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. So the people bowed their heads and worshiped, and the children of Israel went away and did just as Moses and Aaron said. It's one thing to get a lamb. Oh, I know Jesus. Oh, man, me and Jesus are cool. He's my homeboy. It's another thing to get a lamb. It's another thing to kill the lamb and apply the blood to your life. It's a whole different thing. When you say, Lord... Forgive me of my sin. I know the angel of death is coming. And by the way, the angel of death is coming to every single one of our houses. Every single one of you, your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, everything, everybody you know, everybody you know is going to die. Don't be shocked when it happens. It will be sad, but don't be shocked. And don't blame God because it's going to happen. You're going to die. I'm going to die. My wife's going to die. My kids are going to die. Why? Because we're sinners and this body has a time clock. It's just the way it is. Some people die. Violently, some people die young, early, set. Guess what? It happens. It's going to happen. But here's the good news. You don't have to stay dead. If you take the blood of the lamb, Christ, and apply it to your life, how do you do that? You admit you're a sinner. You admit that Jesus is the lamb who was slain. You admit that he died for your sin, and then he rose from the dead, and he's alive. And today he's offering salvation to you, just like God told them. Listen, if you put the blood on the door, the angel of death will pass over. Simple. Pharaoh, put the blood on your door. Pharaoh, go ahead. If you want. Because the angel of death can't come in if the blood on the door is there. Matter of fact, we got a picture of this for you. The blood is on the side. The doorpost is on the right and left. Two doorposts and the lintel. Now, I'm not going to get too spiritual and read anything into this, but it's ironic that there's blood right where one hand is, the other hand is, and where his head was where they had to read. I don't know that's why they did that, though. But it's kind of eerie. That when you walk in, the blood covers you. Why didn't they put the door, the blood on the floor? Because you'd walk on it. You don't want to walk on the blood. You want to walk under the blood. Now, that's just a little free nugget. I don't know if that's really why he did it that way. But if you want to get, woo, you can use that one on you. <laughs> 
But he says, put the blood on the door, on the two doorposts and on the lintel. And the angel of death, when he sees the blood of the lamb, how more explicitly clear can you get? Then the blood of the lamb, when Jesus is the lamb that was slain, a lamb that was of pure, holy, where well, Jesus had no sin, no bones broken. Jesus' bones were not broken. Why didn't they break his bones? Because he was dead. When you crucified someone, crucifixion was a death by suffocation. It was not death by nails in the hand. You would hang there with these nails in your hand, the pain, all that, the dislocated shoulders, uh, the, the nails to your feet, it was painful. But that wasn't what killed you. What killed you is you couldn't hold yourself up and you would suffocate. And if you hung there too long, usually they would hang there three days, the birds would come pluck at their, pluck at their flesh. And if you didn't die, they would break your legs, you couldn't push up to breathe, and you would suffocate. But they beat Christ so bad before he was crucified. They flogged him 39 times with his back, with the reeds, with the punches. With the, they beat him so bad that he died in six hours. So he didn't break his legs. He had no bones broken, as the Bible says. Same thing with the little lamb. Oh, it's a coincidence, Pastor. Okay, good. I love that coincidence, though. I just happen to love it. I just think it's Jesus all over right there. Third, flee the bondage of slavery in Egypt. Flee the bondage of slavery in Egypt. Chapter 12, verse 29. It says, It came to pass at midnight the Lord struck the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the livestock. So Pharaoh rose in night, he and all his servants, all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt. And there, has not, there was not one house where there was not one dead. And he called Moses and Aaron at night and said, Rise, go up uh, from among my people, both you and your children of Israel. Go serve the Lord as you said. Take your flocks, your herds, as you have said, be gone and bless me. And the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land, for they said, we shall all be dead if you don't leave. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, having their kneading bowls bound up with their clothes and their shoulders. And the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, and they asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, gold, and clothing. Remember that. Remember that. Take all these valuables because later on we're going to build a temple with it because your valuables in the world have no value in the heaven unless you invest it in the kingdom. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean your house is useless. It doesn't mean your 401k is useless. But when you die, you can't take the benefit of it with you unless it's invested in the kingdom. Does that mean you have to invest all your money in the kingdom? No, it doesn't at all. But what he's going to have them do is they're going to carry around all the silver and gold in the in thing and say, my goodness, this has no value out here. And you know what? <laughs> Money has very little value to really give you happiness. I mean, we've all had nice cars, nice things before, and the value and the fun, the fun just went away. I got a car two years ago, and, and I, it broke down, so I had to drive my, my daughter's lime green bug <laughs> to church. And on the back it says, seniors, 05. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm driving here, senior high school, hey, 05, 05. <laughs> Stuff comes and goes. What's invested in the kingdom when your life, that's what's going to last. So here they carry around this gold. I promise you, I wasn't there, but I promise you, at least one person was going, why are we carrying this stuff? <laughs> We're out here. No, there's no stores out here. I ain't seen no Nordstrom's, no malls. I can't spend this stuff. Why don't we just leave it out here? God says, just carry the stuff. I'll tell you later why you need it. Look, let's keep reading. In verse uh, 36, the Lord uh, said, the Lord had given people in favor inside of the Egyptians, so they granted them what they requested, and they plundered the Egyptians. The Egyptians said, take it all. The children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men. Everyone say 600,000 men. If you take 600,000 soldiers, which they were, parents, brothers, sisters, that's how you get two to three million people. These were just the men. These weren't the children. These weren't the wives. They weren't the parents. It was just the men of all above 20 years old. Okay, so that's where they get that. In verse 38, a mixed multitude went up with them, also flocks and herds and a great deal of livestock, and they baked unleavened breads of the dough which they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened because they were driven out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they um, prepared provisions for themselves. The next thing, you, first thing, you, after you get your lamb, after you apply the blood, after God, the angel of death passes you, leave Egypt. What does that mean? Don't live like you used to live. You used to be addicted to stuff. And addiction doesn't mean you're like on crack and you're sitting on. Uh, 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 that's not addicted. Addicted means that when you go home today, you're going to do something you do 
every day that you can't not do. Okay? That you can't not do. In other words, I'm going to go home today, I'm going to look at football. I do that every Sunday. I do that every day. But I cannot do it. I cannot do it. I don't have to do it. Walk away. Whatever your issue is. Pornography, alcohol, anger, cursing, whatever it is, walk away. When God sets you free, walk away. Now, is it that simple all the time? No, but you know what? God provides you with the strength. Other brothers and sisters in Christ, counseling, re whatever it is, go get it done. Because before you, before you have Christ in your life, you are a slave to sin. Does that mean you can't stop doing some things? No, it doesn't mean that, but it means you can't stop doing everything. And when you get Christ, there is nothing in your life that you consciously do that you cannot stop doing. And God sets you spiritually free to say no. To say no. I used to do cocaine. I don't anymore. I stopped it one day. Why? Because Christ set me free and I walked away. And the day that I accepted Christ, I called my drug dealer seven times. I said, I'm going to call him one more time. One more time. One more time. He ain't there. And I, it, it, that process, it took about 10 minutes of me realizing it's over. I was in Egypt going, I don't know. I don't know. And then I said, I'm, I'm done. I never went back. You have to walk away. You can't just pray, God, forgive me, come up to the altar, okay, God, and then go back and do what you did. No, no, no. He is setting you free so you can go worship him. Number four, you must allow God to lead the way. You must allow God to lead the way. I'm getting ready to get excited once I show you this one thing. Chapter 13, verse 17. And next week, we're going to see them walk through the Red Sea. we got a little video clip. It's going to fire you up. Y'all are going to be screaming. Well, I'm going to be screaming. I don't know if y'all, hopefully y'all are screaming. It's going to be amazing. Then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that he did not heed them by way of the land of the Philistines or lead them. Although that was near, they could have walked through the land of the Philistines and got to Israel really quick. God said, no, I can't take you that way because the Philistines might beat you down. Sometimes we get saved, we think God should do something this way, this way. God says, no, no, I want you to do it my way. God's ways are not your ways. God's ways are not my ways. Our job is to trust him. Don't try to figure it out. Just let him lead you. doesn't mean you don't think, but think about what he's trying to lead you in. We went to a church uh, this past week, uh, this Thursday and Friday in Chicago. It's Willow Creek Church. They have 7,300 seat sanctuary. It's been open for a month. I was there about nine months ago when they were building it. It was unbelievable. The reason we went there, they had a conference on volunteers. They have 10,000 volunteers at their church. Not 10,000 people, 10,000 volunteers. So they had a conference on how to get volunteers. I was like, why would we try to figure it out? Let's go learn. So why would you want to do that with your life? When God says, I want to teach you. And the quicker you let God lead you, the quicker you're going to find happiness and joy with God and peace with God and in your life. Look what it says in verse 18. Uh, verse 17, is the last sentence says, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. That's why he didn't lead them that way. So God led the people. Everyone say God led the people. God led the people by the way of the wilderness and the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. Verse 19, this is what fires me up. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. Ah, Ah, let's read it again. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had placed, he, Joseph, placed the children of Israel under oath, saying, God will surely visit you and carry up my, and, and you shall carry my bones from here. Turn to, now you're in Exodus, the book right before it is Genesis. Turn to Genesis chapter 50, the very last two verses. Now, while you do that, I'm going to give you a little quiz. Abraham had a son named? Isaac had a son named? Jacob's name was changed to? Israel had how many sons? And they sold who to where? And to where? That's why they're in Egypt. And who did Joseph work for? Potiphar. Remember his, whose wife had? Remember Potiphar's wife had long eyes for her brother? Okay, and right when Joseph died, verse 25, chapter 50, look what Joseph did. This is 430 years before they, they were delivered. 
430 years before Moses took his bones, here's what he said, verse 25. Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here. What was he talking about? God made a promise to Abraham, his great, great, his great granddaddy. And he knew God would be faithful. God is faithful. God says, I'm coming back. And all those who have the blood of the lamb are my children. All those who reject my son's blood are not my children. That's not something the rock made up. It's something that's been in the Bible since the beginning. And so when the angel of death came through, he didn't look to see how many money people had or whether they're black, white, Hispanic, or actually in this scenario, African or Jew. All he looked for was the blood. So when you stand before God, when you die, which you will, don't, oh, yo, yo, what's up, God? You know me, you know, I, you know, I, 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 you know what happened was I, my parents were, no, no, no. Do you have the blood? Do you have the blood of the lamb? Well, what lamb? <laughs> Jesus was the lamb that was slain. You certainly saw the Passion movie. <laughs> oh, yo, yeah, Mel Gibson. I know Mel. I told him to make the movie. Yeah, and I paid him $300 million, and that, that's a small price for all the people who got saved. And I'm happy Mel made money on my, I'm, I'm God, talking to this brother at the gate. Don't worry about the money Mel made. Worry about all the millions of souls that got saved, okay? So let me ask you a question. What did you do with the blood? Well, God, see, I thought that there was all these other things and ways I can, you know, if I just be, what, what did my son say to you? I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There's none good, no, not one. You know, there was a rich young ruler. Guy had a lot of money and influence. Him, Jesus says, hey, Jesus, uh, what good thing may I do to get to heaven? Thing. The significance was not in the fact that he was rich. The significance was that he trusted in his riches. He trusted himself. He said, God, what good thing may I do? You know what Jesus said? There's none good, no, not one except God. So let's start this conversation over. If you call me good, you must acknowledge me as God because no one's good except God. So how do you want to do this? Okay, uh, what do I got to do? Don't kill your mother. Obey the commandments. Oh, I did all that. Jesus, I'm cool, right? I said, no, one more thing. I want you to deny everything you love and follow me. I want your whole life. You know, when I was at this conference, it was on volunteerism. They interviewed Curtis Sliwa, the head of the Guardian Angels. It was the most entertaining. I could have listened to this dude for a week. He's from New York. So he had the whole New York thing, which I love because I'm from New York, but he was hilarious. Hilarious. I was so upset. I'm not upset, but I was like, man, keep. It was, like, it was a little good 20, 30 minute interview, but it was hilarious. But the reason they interviewed him was the whole point was that here's a guy who challenges people to put their life on the line for people they don't know. That's the guardian angels. We want you to put your life on the line. Six people have died being, by doing their duty as guardian angels. He's been, his life is, is he's been shot and beat all the too, but he didn't die, obviously. So, 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 so the pastor, Bill Hybels, was saying, so let me get this straight. You're asking people to put their life on the line and die for other people. He said, I read that somewhere. I read that somewhere. You know when you give your life to Christ because you realize you're going to die anyway? You're saying, Lord, take my life. So when I die, I don't die. Because I know I'm going to die. But I don't want to die. So take my life. So when I die, I don't die. What does that mean? I don't go to hell. I have eternal life. I realize that the blood of the Lamb is you. I get it. And I don't want to be like the Egyptians. I don't want to be like that. I want to be, remember, remember the Bible says the mixed multitude went out. What does that mean? That they were Israelites and non-Israelites. You know what happened? I believe the word got out. The word, yo, 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 I know you ain't one of our peoples, but you need to get yourself a lamb and put the blood on the door. Well, okay, okay. You remember the frogs and the hell and, and the fire and all that stuff? That guy's coming back. He's going he gonna to kill, you, kill your son. Just get a lamb, put it on the door, and pray. Some of the magician boys said, I don't know about Pharaoh, but I'm going to try this. <laughs> I'm guessing that's how they became a mixed multitude, and I'm guessing how they figured it out. 
But they, you know, we, we don't we want to leave with y'all. <laughs> because we see your God is doing stuff our gods can't do. Amen. In a minute, we're going to pray. You may realize, you know, I'm a sinner. I'm going to die. And I don't want the angel of death to take me to hell. I want the angel of death to pass over me. And the only way I can do that is with the blood of the lamb. And the lamb is Jesus. So I want to confess, yes, I'm a sinner. I want to believe that he is the lamb that was slain for me. He rose, and I want to ask him to forgive me. It's a very simple thing. Again, this historical precedence to this death, the shedding of a lamb's blood. But there's also historical precedence to the fact that you've got to do something. If you don't do it, you don't benefit. After Popeye finished telling his story to his kids, he was reminiscing and looking up and telling the story, and they were showing a video, and he looked over, and they were gone. He looked outside, and they were sitting on top of an ice cream truck, licking on ice cream cones instead of eating their spinach. And guess who was feeding them the ice cream? Hercules. He had his little good humor suit on. Good humor was the ice cream, man. Y'all have good humor out here? Good humor was the bomb. There's always going to be temptation to take the ice cream, the easy way out. It ain't easy. It ain't easy. You will die. Hell is permanent. There's no second chance. Heaven is eternal. And once you're in, you in. But it, eternity starts now. So let's all bow our heads and pray. Lord, you gave us warning after warning after warning, metaphor after metaphor after metaphor. Word picture after word picture after word picture. You have told us over and over again, the lamb without blemish, without a bone broken, must die. And the blood must be applied. And then you will be free. If today you're saying, Lord, please forgive me. Cleanse me of my sin. I want to be forgiven. I want the blood of the lamb to be applied to my life. In other words, I want... Jesus Christ to be my Savior. If that's you, pray this prayer with me. Pray, dear God, yes, I believe I'm a sinner. I believe you are the Lamb of God. I believe your blood was shed for my sin. Please forgive me, Lord. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit. I want to be born all over again. I receive salvation this morning, God. Thank you, Lord. As our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, if you pray that prayer and today you're saying, Lord, please forgive me. Please pass over me with the angel of death. Please receive me as your child this morning. If that's you, I'm going to ask you right now to stand to your feet and acknowledge his forgiveness in your life. God bless you. Stay standing, please. God bless you. Good. Stand to your feet if today you're saying, yes, Lord, please forgive me. Stand to your feet. God is reaching out to you this morning. And he's telling you he loves you. He's telling you, please don't pass over this opportunity. Anybody else, stand to your feet. Acknowledge his forgiveness in your life. Now we're going to ask you who are standing to do one more thing. As we welcome you to the family of God, we're going to ask you to come out of your seat and come on down here to the altar. And let's give them a hand as they come on down. Come on up out of your seat. Come on down to the altar. Amen. Amen. Who's the man? God bless you. Stay right here, okay? Stay right here. You face me. Face me. The Bible says, the Bible says if you confess your sin, God is faithful and just to forgive you. He remembers it no more, the Bible says. The angel of death ain't coming back around. <laughs> and God has a plan for your life. And we want to encourage all y'all. If God has forgiven you, walk out of Egypt. Don't hang out in the malls. Don't hang out in the outskirts. Leave. Leave that old life. God has something so much better for you. And God has something very good for you too. 
We have to apply the blood and we have to walk with him. We have to let God lead us into a new life. Next week, we're going to see them walk through the Red Sea. I want to encourage you to bring a friend. we got two more weeks. If you want to go see Rough and Road, go check it out right now. Go and tour, see where it's at. But we're going to be there on November 21st. Let's pray for this, brother, and then we'll, we'll leave. Lord, we thank you so much for your faithfulness. We thank you for this courageous man. We pray, Lord, that you, you, would honor his faith and his courage. That you would set him free like he's never been free before. And I pray all of us would walk out of Egypt and allow you to supernaturally guide and direct us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to ask you right now to walk to that guy right there. We're going to keep giving something. God bless you. See you next week.